as Jonathan said, we first met two years ago. I received an invitation to do a Hustings, and I thought, ah, it's a faith Hustings. This will be, I thought, a very civilised gathering. I expected it to be one of the easier Hustings that I was going to do. And in, pa in practice, it was one of the most difficult. The levers were absolutely apocalyptic in their stories of what remaining in the European Union was going to be like, how dreadful life inside the European Union was like, and how much better the world was going to be if we could be effectively go global, as the language now is. And I sat there and thought, this is a bit difficult. This isn't quite what I was expecting. It wasn't necessarily the respectful approach to understanding the other and listening that I had expected. It was also one of the first times that I realised that the chances of the UK voting to stay in the European Union were a little bit unlikely, because at the end of the hustings, those people that were in favour of remaining were rather fewer than at the start of the meeting. And so, obviously, I had to think, well, that was partly because the case I had made was not as effective as the cases made by the two people advocating leave. But it was very much the sense that, actually, the power of advocacy and using the words of the Bible could be very effective. And the interesting thing was that in both cases, the speakers for the leave side looked to words from the Old Testament and I was very much using words from the New Testament, as I think did my other Remain colleague, who was a Dutch um, Christian Democrat who'd come over to support me. But when Jonathan wrote to me again and said, well, we're doing a very different sort of event, I thought, is this going to be a good idea? Do I actually want to accept another invitation from Jonathan? <laughs> so I left it a little bit, and he wrote again and said, just wondering, did you get the invitation? And I said, well, yes, I did. And I thought about it and said, yes, I was willing to speak about a Christian social reformer. And he suggested that I speak about a female social reformer and said, you know, possibly Florence Nightingale. And I thought, well, I was never terribly inspired by Florence Nightingale when I was a child. Don't particularly know why. But for some reason, her story didn't resonate especially. Whereas I remember from primary school being told about Elizabeth Fry and how she had gone into prisons and sought to reform prisons. And in many ways, the story and the memory that I have is that of a small child being taught the Christian faith, but also being taught with very small vignettes of people's histories. And when I was preparing for today, I went back to look into a little bit more detail on Elizabeth Fry. But my talk is going to be quite different from Philip's, in that I'm not going to spend my 40 minutes giving you the blow-by-blow -blow account of the life of Elizabeth Fry. Obviously, I will be talking about her, what she did, what she sought to achieve, and what her legacy is. But the suggestion was also that I look a little bit at how her legacy can inform thinking, Christian thinking, and Christian work in the 21st century. So the idea is to give a, a mix of the history and also contemporary thinking. But I hope also that what I'm talking about in the context of the 19th century United Kingdom, or particularly the England in which she was working, will put into context some of the ways in which Christian thinkers might have to act and react even in a world in which they're not empowered. They're not necessarily able to vote. They don't necessarily have the sort of voice which we might expect to have in the 21st century. So while Elizabeth Fry was a Christian in a Christian country, quite unlike Kagawa, she was also a woman in a Christian country 200 years ago when people didn't really expect to hear very much from women. So two of the issues that I want to touch on are really the role of women in public life, but also the role of Christianity in the United Kingdom, because the contrast couldn't be more different. In the 19th century, to be Christian was normal. To be a woman in the political sphere was not. Unless, of course, you were the monarch. And this is the odd thing about the United Kingdom that for many decades, 
in several centuries, the United Kingdom has had a female head of state. Elizabeth I, Queen Victoria, who was the monarch at the time that Elizabeth Fry was doing her work, and since the 1950s, Elizabeth II. So in some ways, the United Kingdom is a country that is used to having women involved in public life but they certainly didn't have a vote for many years, and it wasn't expected that they would normally speak in the public arena. But it was expected that they would be Christian. In the 21st century, it is absolutely normal for women to be involved in public life. It is perhaps rather less normal that they would speak up about their faith and that their evangelism would actually come to the fore. And they are two changes that I want to stress most profoundly for today and then touch on one thing at the end of the talk which is a bit about demographic change because one of the things that marked Elizabeth Fry out something of her time was the fact that she was a married woman who had the time to do voluntary work at a time when most women didn't work you might be a servant or you would be a relatively wealthy married woman and you wouldn't have gone and worked outside the home now, the majority of women in the United Kingdom would be expected to work outside the home and be paid. And that means that the sort of people who might in the past have been available to do charitable work actually aren't as available. So my final lesson for today is going to be a little bit about the voluntary sector and maybe how we need to think about the role of individuals in society. Because over the last 50, 75 years, the United Kingdom has changed fundamentally. But also, I think, the thinking about Elizabeth Fry and hearing about Kagawa earlier, um, Toihiko Kagawa, actually also fits together because Philip was telling us about how appalled Kagawa was to go to the United States and feel this is supposed to be a Christian country and yet what are we really getting? Is it a Christian country? How do we understand that? And I think there are questions that we might ask in the 21st century about the nature of the United Kingdom, a country that still has an established church, the Church of England, so a Christian country, and yet one that is profoundly secular. So, Elizabeth Fry, born in 1780 in Norwich, so not too far away from here. Um, if our transport communications were better, it would be about an hour away. But by train or car on a good day, it's about an hour away from Cambridge. But in a very different sort of world. And when I walked in this afternoon, people were being asked, what are your hobbies and how many siblings do you have? And I was speaking to Jonathan and Philip when I the first break came and they said yes it's a good thing that nobody said I haven't got any siblings and I said well I haven't got any siblings so obviously I would have been the weak link in the discussion <laughs> however Elizabeth Fry had many siblings I don't have the precise number of siblings she had but she was born into a Quaker family in, 80, in 1780 a wealthy Quaker family in banking her mother died when Elizabeth was 12, and so she took over responsibility for her siblings. So there was very much a family orientation from the outset. At the age of 18, she decided to make a much more profound commitment to the Quaker faith, and she, was ordained, she became a Quaker minister. Now, if you think about it, 200 years ago in Britain, you wouldn't have expected women to be ministers. In the Church of England, that would have been impossible. In the Catholic Church, it is still impossible. In the Quaker religion, it was possible for women to be ministers, and the Quaker faith was one that was extremely open and tolerant in a way that the more established religions or the disestablished Catholic Church nevertheless had a very different approach. That was true in the years when it was founded in the 17th century, but remains true in the 21st century. And towards the end of today's talk, I will just touch on some of the issues which have become very prevalent in the discussions between church and faith and the current secular order in the United Kingdom. But also note that it happens that the Quaker 
faith would actually be much more at home in secular Britain than some of the other more established churches and also more at home than the evangelical movements. So having chosen Elizabeth Fry from childhood memory, there is also a way in which her faith and her thinking would actually in some ways still be very much at home in 21st century Britain. But the Quakers might bring a rather different understanding of evangelism to the 21st century from that of the 19th century. Now, it is suggested in an article from 1994 that every school child knows about Elizabeth Fry. So I tried this on a couple of sixth formers this week. They were coming to work with me in the Lords, and I said to one of them, could you just do a little Google search on Elizabeth Fry? And she looked a little bit confused and said, who is Elizabeth Fry? I think I vaguely know. And her friend, who is only 16, said, I've no idea who Elizabeth Fry is. Well, until a few years ago, she was on a five pound note. So she is one of the very few women who has played a sufficient role in British history to be on our currency. There aren't very many. Florence Nightingale has been one, and Jane Austen, the author, is another. Apart from, obviously, Queen Elizabeth II is on our currency, Victoria was on the currency in the past, and I guess Elizabeth the, Queen, the first was many centuries ago. But Elizabeth Fry was recognised as a social reformer, as somebody who was committed to prison reform. So she was, as I say, born in 1780, made a commitment to Christianity when she was 18, and was married at the age of 20. Married to William Fry, and in the course of the next 22 years, becomes mother to 11 children. So the question of can you be married, have children, and also play a role through faith and play a role in society, well, Elizabeth Fry proves that absolutely you can do that, or you could do that in the 18th century. But of course, there were criticisms. There were people who said, what is this married woman doing going outside of the home, neglecting her children? Well, as I said at the outset, she did come from a wealthy background, so she wouldn't have just been leaving her 11 children at home to look after themselves. There would actually have been people at home able to look after the children. So I don't think there was a case of neglect. But what we have is a young woman who was evangelized and also motivated by a fellow Quaker to go and visit Newgate Jail. So having been born in Norwich, she had moved with her husband to the city of London and was invited in 18, um, 1811, 1812 to go to Newgate Jail. And here you had a prison that had men and women and Elizabeth Fry was appalled at what she saw. Now, what do you read about Elizabeth Fry differs a little bit. There are books that she wrote, and there are some books which have been seen by at least one author as hagiography, that some, that some people write about her as if what she did and what she achieved was so groundbreaking that we can do nothing but say, what an amazing woman, how much she achieved. And some authors have wanted to say, well, maybe that goes a little bit far. She wasn't necessarily as groundbreaking as she appeared, that what she sought to achieve in prisons wasn't necessarily new. She didn't come to the reform of prisons with a whole blueprint that she herself had dreamt up. But I think one question is, does that matter? Some people have a role that is as a theologian. It might be to sit as a monk or a nun and contemplate and write and change things that way. It might be through the power of prayer. It might be through Siri trying to um, give us some assistance. <laughs> and it, but, so we may have people who are theologians. We may have people whose role in life is to, have, to be innovative. And in some cases, the role of people is actually to be able to deliver change. 
And what we have in the form of Elizabeth Fry is a woman who made change to her local community, but also contributed to changes in the law in the United Kingdom and left a legacy of prison reform. But she also left a legacy of training nurses and a legacy that included Florence Nightingale going to Crimea. So not only does Elizabeth Fry come as the main focus, but she leaves the legacy of Florence Nightingale as one of the other key social reformers. Jane Austen is not going to feature again in the talk. But Elizabeth Fry decides that she needs to change things. In her late teens, that includes running a Sunday school, teaching the local children to read, and ensuring that people in her local community are empowered. Very much the sort of thing that Quakers would be expected to do, because the key understanding right from the creation of the Quakers in 1647 was that God's light is in every person. And that was fundamentally what drove Quakers in the 17th century and what drove Elizabeth Fry. For her, her faith was paramount and she wanted to change things. So initially, it was about the local community, but it was also particularly about looking after women, educating women, and also health. So she even got herself trained to the point where she could go and give vaccinations to local children against smallpox. Now, if you think, 200 years ago, a woman going and giving vaccinations, quite an unusual thing to be doing. But in 1811, 1812, she goes off to visit Newgate Prison and is appalled. And she writes about the scenes that she sees and argues that they are essentially scenes of debauchery, of women engaging in totally inappropriate behaviour. Other writers have suggested that perhaps this relates more to Elizabeth Fry's own character and the social class that she came from, that some of the activities that the women in the prison were undertaking, they were playing cards, they were gambling, were things that actually women from the lower orders did. That if you were a poor woman, not from the middle class, then maybe you did play cards. That what they were doing wasn't necessarily quite as debauched as Elizabeth Fry felt. Nevertheless, there was clearly a problem in Newgate Jail. There was overcrowding. There were people who could not afford enough to live on. Yes, food was given to them, but the rations weren't enough. Some people had food brought into them, others didn't. So there was a real problem for Elizabeth Fry that she could, or in Newgate, that she could see. And her brother-in-law was to write that she described terrible scenes of poverty, women scantily dressed, begging at the gratings, playing at cards, swearing and drunk, and violent. Overcome with sadness, Elizabeth pulled out her Bible and began to read to them. It captured their attention. Many of the women asked who Christ was. Encouraged, over subsequent visits, Elizabeth gradually put in place a new regime designed to reform the female prisoners. And this included school for their children, a female matron to look after the female prisoners. And apparently that was one thing that really was unique. Nobody had thought about actually making sure that there was a medical person responsible for the women in the prison. But she also wanted useful work to occupy people's time. So not simply saying to the women, you've got to work because you're here, but rather actually getting them to do things that might be useful. And in addition, she formed a ladies' association, the members of which would visit the women in prison. And in light of all this, Elizabeth Fry then got the Lord Mayor, the sheriffs and the aldermen to come and watch the readings in prison. And here you have one of the sides of the whole idea of prison reform and the role of Elizabeth Fry that might be open to some question. Does this begin to sound a bit like a circus why would you go and watch middle-class ladies reading the Bible to prisoners? Was this really the right thing to be doing? And I think in some ways that does sound a little bit strange. In the current you know, 21st century, 
what would that be like? That would be like a pastor going in to a prison and taking in somebody recording for YouTube and showing on YouTube, you know, I went and read the Bible to these people and they all stopped and listened. And maybe that sounds voyeuristic and maybe it sounds unpleasant and maybe it's not something we would actually think was a good idea now. But apparently Elizabeth Fry also stopped and wondered whether this was actually the right thing to be doing and decided that on balance it probably was because it was a way of getting the issue noticed. And here is, I think, a way in which we could understand some of Jonathan's talk earlier about being the salt, that you need to be able to touch things and actually you need to be able to change things. And Elizabeth Fry, as an individual visiting a prison, taking clothes, taking food, would make a difference to a few people. By making the situation much more clear to a range of people, including members of parliament, including ministers, so government ministers, she could actually bring about change in the legislation. She could bring about prison reform in a way that wasn't going to happen otherwise. So they may not have been her unique ideas, but she was the person that was able through her faith to go in and say, I'm making a difference. And to the extent that she made a difference, she was absolutely clear that it was the Lord's doing. She didn't make any claim that it was she as an individual that mattered, but it was God working through her that mattered. And she was able to bring about change. There was a new act in 1823, a jail act, because she had persuaded the Home Secretary, Robert Peel, that legislative reform for prisons was needed. She was able to go and talk to Queen Victoria. She was able to make a difference. She also, in some ways, set the agenda for women in society. At a time when it was not unusual for women to go and do charitable activities, what was unusual was for a woman to speak in Parliament. Exactly 200 years ago, Elizabeth Fry became the first woman to go and give evidence to a committee in the House of Commons. It was a committee on prison reform, and she was able to go and say, this is what it, what it looks like. And that made a difference to the report that actually came out. A hundred years before any single woman had the legal right to vote in Parliament, Elizabeth Fry was able to speak in Parliament and get her voice noted. So in some ways, she can be seen as also a model for later, if not feminists, at least women pushing for a role in society. And in particular, she, was, she and her family were friends with some of the reformers who would later go on to be suffragists, the non-violent supporters of enfranchisement for women. Finally then, in terms of a couple of the other things Elizabeth Fry did before I turn to the legacy, she also um, set up a night shelter for the homeless. She was very keen to think about people who were less privileged. So it wasn't simply about prison reform, it was about others less, in, less advantaged in society. But she also set up um, a nursing school and that is apparently what inspired Florence Nightingale to take nurses to the fight, to, sorry, to support those who were fighting in the Crimean War. And the nurses she took with her had been trained at Elizabeth Fry's school. So we have a legacy that goes into nursing and goes into another very visible and active form of a Christian playing her role in the international arena, not just in the national arena. And just to get in another social reformer before I turn away, because Philip said, oh, well, it's really unusual. Most people talk about William Wilberforce. Um, apparently, William Wilberforce was a friend and an admirer of Elizabeth Fry. So just to make sure he gets into the equation. And for anybody that's interested, um, Wilberforce Road in Cambridge is named after William Wilberforce, and I think it's Trinity that also has a memorial to him. So there is a Cambridge connection to William Wilberforce. I don't know of any Cambridge connection to Elizabeth Fry. I fear. But turning to the more contemporary, and I think I've got about 15 minutes left. Is that acceptable? I note that at the very start of the information for the school, 
we have a quotation from Daniel. The people who know their God shall be strong and take action. And I think that very clearly relates to Elizabeth Fry. But I also wanted to relate it to a more contemporary figure, a very different figure, but one that I hope will help us transition through from the 19th to the 20th and now the 21st century. And that person is somebody called Tony Benn. Now, I'm aware that there are a few people in the room who are British and will, of course, have heard about Elizabeth Fry when they were at school and who will remember who Tony Benn was. And I get to say, well, hang on, why is he brought in? But Tony Benn actually wrote a book on being Daniel. And for him, he was a Labour MP. He was a passionate left-wing Labour MP whose politics, particularly in the very early years, were informed very much by his Christian faith. Apparently, towards the end of his life, he became what he called a Christian agnostic. So he was less evangelizing, but his, his socialism, it was suggested, was less informed by Karl Marx than by Jesus Christ. And what he wanted to do in advocating his particular brand of politics was to say, we need to go back to a Christ, not of the popes, not of hierarchy, but of that carpenter in Nazareth who actually wanted to change the world, who was concerned about people and about social justice. And that so often is something that is forgotten in contemporary Christian thinking. Now, I think the thing that I haven't yet told, it, told you is that I come to this talk and to discussing Elizabeth Fry and Christianity in the UK, not as a Quaker, nor as an evangelical Christian. I come to it as a Roman Catholic. So obviously, women still don't have um, the opportunity to become priests. And my church does still have quite a hierarchical approach to faith. But we also now have a pope whose view of Christianity is quite different, that it is biblical, but it does go back very much to that idea of social justice. So some of the thinking that may be infused left-wing socialist thinking and the socialist left, sorry, the socialist Christian movement through the 20th century in the United Kingdom also perhaps begins to shape some aspects of Catholic thinking in the 21st century. But the reason for mentioning Tony Benn is because he, in many ways, had views that are deeply similar to those of the current Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn. So whatever you know about British history or British politics, if you are following the news while you're here, then you may at least be aware that the current leader of the Labour Party is Jeremy Corbyn, whose approach to politics is very much about that of dealing with social justice and concern about inequality. I'm not going to get into wider issues of international politics. But his approach doesn't come necessarily from a faith perspective, but very much fits with the thinking put forward by somebody like Tony Benn. Benn's politics started in the middle of the 20th century, when it was still, as in the 19th century, absolutely the norm to talk about Christianity, where people's ideas of faith and morality could suffuse their politics. It could su suffuse ideas of the voluntary sector, but also would be embedded in political and social life. Somebody like Gladstone as pr the great liberal prime minister in the 19th century would quote from the Bible. There is a huge amount that he wrote that refers back to the Bible and theology. Increasingly through the 20th century, the United Kingdom became secularized. And we had a point under the government of Tony Blair when his spin doctor simply said, we don't do God. Now, we, the person speaking was Alastair Campbell, who did the press for Tony Blair. Tony Blair himself did do God. He was a deeply committed Christian who became a Catholic after he, was, he stopped being prime minister. But what we had was a prime minister who was 
he and his, his media um, communications officers would say, we don't want to talk about religion. And that is something that now permeates life in the United Kingdom. So in, in 1880, when Elizabeth Fry spoke in Parliament, the peculiarity wasn't that she was Christian or that she was willing to talk about her faith. It was that she was a woman speaking in Parliament. In 2018, it is absolutely normal for women to be speaking in Parliament. But what is far less likely is for women or men to stand up in Parliament or in other spheres of life and say, this is what I believe and this is what shapes my thinking. And here it's very different from the United States. In the US, there's still that sense of, would you elect a president who said, I do not believe in God? Probably not. There'd be a suspicion. David Cameron, when he was prime minister, pretty much said, well, I'm not really sure. Theresa May as prime minister does have faith. She goes to church every Sunday. But even she is a little reluctant to talk about faith. And over the years, there have been some real questions about what the role of faith in politics is and can be. There is an all-party parliamentary group on Christians in Parliament. And they very helpfully wrote to me yesterday. Um, so it helped my preparations for today enormously. Because they wrote to say, we've got a new um, inquiry being set up. We'd like you to think about being involved. And while we're doing that, we're sending you the summary of our two previous inquiries about faith in the community and freedom of Christians in the United Kingdom. And what they found in 2012, so just six years ago, was that Christians in the United Kingdom face problems in living out their faith. And these problems have been mostly caused by and, and accelerated by social, cultural, and legal challenges over the past decade. So in the latter part of the 20th century through to the early part of the 21st century in the United Kingdom, we have seen a move towards secularization. We have seen very much a move towards a small L, liberal, tolerant order. But it's one where people of faith might have questions. And the issues that come to the fore and raise particular tensions in the United Kingdom are ones which I suspect for those of you who are evangelical Christians will ring alarm bells, but maybe for Elizabeth Fry, if she really were a very modern day Quaker, would not. So the issues that really cause tensions surround moral issues, abortion, adoption by gay couples, equal marriage, questions which the Quakers would say, we've been thinking about these for decades, they're not a problem, but which for many other Christian denominations and people of other faiths, devout Muslims particularly, would say, well, maybe there are some questions. And what we've seen over the years is a move to legalize equality in many ways, which is clearly desirable. But that legalization and the deliberate attempts to ensure that everybody is viewed as being equal has in some ways led to some self-restraint self and some constraints such that Christians don't always feel able to stand up and say, I believe this, this is what I think. And so I think the, the current inquiry that the all-party parliamentary group wants to, to look at is really what role can Christians play and how do we ensure that there can be the opportunity to live out one's life through faith and still be respectful of everybody. And this is where I probably also have to admit, not just to being a Catholic, but to being a Liberal Democrat. So as Jonathan said, I sit in the House of Lords. The Liberal Democrats is a, a party that has particular party policy on abortion and assisted dying um, and on equal marriage. Most of the, those things were debated before I arrived in Parliament. The question of assisted dying is an ongoing question, but it's one where even when it's next being debated, obviously my view as a Catholic is that 
I will almost certainly be going through a different lobby from my colleagues. And more or less, there is still an acceptance that if you believe something and it is a matter of conscience, you can still do that. But there is just that slight sense in my party and beyond that it is more important to accept the equality that has been outlined and the way my colleagues see views on social questions and not always to listen with quite as much respect to people who might put forward views that come from a faith perspective. So that I think leaves some difficult questions for people in the United Kingdom seeking to play out their faith. And it's a point where I would say very strongly that some of my colleagues on the cross benches, so in the House of Lords, some members sit as independents and they can vote however they want. They vote according to their conscience on all issues. And two of them in particular, David Alton and Caroline Cox, spend a lot of time passionately standing up for the rights of Christians whether in this country or internationally. And I would actually very much like to pay tribute to them today. But we are in a position in 2018 where, of course, the rights of Christians in the United Kingdom are protected. And maybe we need, in fact, to be ensuring that we don't engage in self-censorship, but be willing to stand up and be counted. Be that in political life, or in NGOs or advocacy groups. But in particular, I would suggest there is also a gap. And that is, as I suggested at the outset, in the voluntary sector or in the charitable sector. Because 200 years ago, you could assume that there would be middle-class mar married women who had nothing apart from looking after their 11 children to do than go and do good works. Well, if the majority of women now go out to work, Who's going to do that voluntary work? Yes, people can do some of it in their spare time, but as we have an aging population and people, men and women, are caught between looking after elderly relatives and young children, we actually need to find a new way of ensuring that people can engage in the sort of activities for social reform that Elizabeth Fry did through her faith 200 years ago. It, some of that may be through politics, it may be through the legislative process, but equally it might be through voluntary work and other types of engagement. But the key thing in the 21st century is not whether you're male or female, not where you come from in society, but how far you're willing to stand up and articulate your views and are willing still to be the salt and maybe even the light. Um, I find the salt always a slightly easier metaphor. But for Elizabeth Fry, I think she would have said she did seek to be the salt, changing people's lives, but actually a light and a beacon. And part of her legacy was prison reform. It may not have gone as far as some of her deepest fans suggested. But ultimately, it was a voice that changed things. And she did that through her faith. And I think I will stop there and hope I've given enough of a sense of a legacy for the 21st century.